Well, brethren, I tell you, a lot of what I have to say has been said in two days. My beloved wife leading out in that. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is what Peter did. My desire is to stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. And this is safe to do this. I think it is a marvelous testimony Amen. to the fact that we're all plowing in the same field when we say the same things, right? So that, that is a source of great comfort to me because I know that you're good brethren. The text again, I want to read it before we launch out into it. For God, for God, who commanded the light, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. I love the way the Spirit speaks here. It's very, very technical. Has shined in our hearts. See. To give the light, not to give the knowledge, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. All sound reasoning begins with these words for God. All light and the benefits thereof have come from God. He's the source of all light. He's not a light. He's the light. In fact, God is light. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. And it cometh down from the Father of lights. Lights. Every kind of light that there is in the world is traceable to God. Whether it is natural or spiritual. Amen. At the beginning, it was God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, and all men have benefited from it, but it came from God. He spoke it. And if we think of the light that is in us spiritually, it is because he has shined in our hearts. It's he that has done this thing. God is light. Is that not the message that we've heard from the beginning, both by the Lord Jesus Christ and by the apostles, that God is light? And in him is no darkness at all. And you know, just like I do, that Jesus never actually said those words. But everything that he said was in the awareness of this marvelous truth that God is the source of all light. And everything he said was built upon it. Think of some of the things that he said. And my desire here is just to show you that not just that God casts light, but that God himself is light. The scripture talks about the light of his countenance. So follow me with this. Luke chapter 10, verse 21 and 22. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. Can you say that, brethren? Can you say that? Can you say that you're thankful that those who are wise in their own eyes can't see the truth? Can you say that? Well, like Brother Gibbon said last night, what would they do with it if they had it? Well, they would toot their own horn, just like they do it now. You see, if God is the source of light, then that means God can withdraw all light at will, and God can bring light at will, and sometimes in the very same place. There are people sitting in the pew that can see it, and there are people that are sitting in the same pew that can't see it. Can you rejoice in that? You see, when people are blinded, whether people want to receive this or not, it glorifies God. Because it proves they can't get it on their own. Oh, he can withdraw the light. Ask the Egyptians how much you get done when God withdraws the light. He can do this if he's the source of light. And he is. And he can also reveal it unto babes. Brethren, if you can enter the kingdom like a child, you don't trust in the arm of flesh, but you lean on the God who is the only source of light, babes will grow up and be men. They will. Amen. Why? Because God is light. Jesus is saying, God's been here. That's why this has happened. How about this? How about the area of conviction? You know, sometimes, you know, sometimes, for some people, they are their most uncomfortable when they're in the assembly. You notice that? 
and they're their most comfortable when they're not in the assembly. They just gab, gab, gab outside the assembly, and they get here and they need nothing. Well, I just uncomfortable. Why is that? Because as above and I've already affirmed, God is light. God is light. This is the condemnation that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hated the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved by the light. Oh, yeah, brethren, when we're here in the assembly and all the brethren are prophesying and a man come in and hear you, remember what he says? That God is in you of a truth. Why? Because his evil deeds were made known. That's why. You ever had that happen? You come into the assembly, maybe something you didn't realize was there, and all of a sudden pops out. Not maybe, someone maybe didn't specifically say anything at all. And yet in the assembly, you found this to be the case. It, what is that? That's God. You see, brethren, when God draws near, he not only shows you about himself, he shows you about yourself. Right. And if you're not filled with pride and you can receive the correction you will actually become the product of light so that your deeds may be wrought in God himself. Why? Because God is light. That's why David could say, search me and try me. Why? Because God is light. That's why. He's light. How about this? John chapter 8, verse 12. I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. How, how do we explain why some people seem to wander aimlessly through life and others seem to know what to do in life and how to live? And they live intentionally toward the Lord and their lives aren't vain. They don't come to the end of their life and all they got to show for it is nothing. Retirement. Oh, it's one of the worst kinds of things that people can have at the end of life. Retirement of all things. I, 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 I'm not against retirement. I'm just saying <laughs> when you retire from the workplace, you don't retire from God's place. Amen. Why do people wander aimlessly? Why do some men run right into traps? You see it clearly, but they don't see it at all. And why do some men avoid the trap? Because some men follow Christ and some men don't. I think people think that somehow when they come into the kingdom, God like hands them a flashlight. And they, it doesn't matter how close or distant they are from the Lord. They've always got this nice little flashlight and they can just kind of see their way. Well, maybe they don't say that, but that's how they live. That's ridiculous. God is light. It's not just that he casts light. He is light, and he remains the light in salvation. And your ability to see or not see will correspond to your nearness to Christ or not. So examine yourselves and see if you be in the faith. Hopefully, brethren, you'll find a good, it'll be a good examination for you. Look at, brethren, all the pitfalls you've avoided. Look at the progress you've made. It's not that you've been so great or so strong. It's that Christ is great and strong. And he's shot. I'm telling you for God. God is light. Think of it this way, and here's kind of my point. The resources that are critical for life and godliness are outside of man's control and fully under God's control. You can't make the light come. The best you can do is ask and seek it. But after all it's said and done, if God didn't want the light to shine in your hearts, you would not have it. Yeah. Amen. But he did. You see, it's all under his control. If you got faith, you received like precious faith from God. If you want grace, you've got to get to the throne of grace to get it. If you want life, you've got to get it from Jesus. And if you want light, you've got to get it from Jesus. Amen. For God. Amen. For God. It is still true of him and through him and to him are all things. So here is the marvelous circumstance that we have. God in wisdom is helping us to believe on the name of his beloved son. He has commanded that you do it, and he has entered into it by wisdom and structure to salvation that if you can see it right, it will encourage you to trust in the name of the Lord your God by the faith of Christ Jesus. It is still the work of God that you believe on him whom he has sent. It is that way. And I'm glad it is that way, brother. And I'll tell you, I was thinking about this Friday. You know what? 
You know that song, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. I was thinking that on Friday. What a marvelous thing this is, brethren. It's one thing for it to be said God is faithful, and that's a good thing. It's another thing when you realize and experience, Brother Matt, that God is exactly what he has said he is. When you find yourself unable to get the resources that you must have, and at certain times God will see to it that you are in circumstances where the only way you're going to get what you need is going to come from him. Paul can tell you what it's like to be in Macedonia and to be pressed out of measure and above strength. But for what reason, brethren? So that we might not trust in ourselves. It is the inveterate tendency of Adam's race to trust in himself. And until he sees his absolute impoverishment, he's going to continue to do this. And so we begin here with a God who is commanding light to shine out of what? Darkness. Darkness. Now, the language draws us right back to the beginning. When God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light. Now, the natural creation being void of light, and it was for a time, he created the heavens and the earth, and yet they were void of light. And darkness was on the deep, and creation didn't have form, and it was void That, brethren, is a marvelous picture of Adam in his fallen state. In fact, when we know we're in good company when we think that way because when God spoke about Israel going back from him, he mentioned Genesis 1 and 2. My people is foolish. They have not known me. They are sottish children. They have none understanding. They are wise to do evil, but to do good they have no knowledge. Why, God? I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void in the heavens, and they had no light. That's why. They're like the creation when I made it before it was given light. This is what happens, brethren, to men when they don't have light. They're void. And they're without any form. And darkness is deep in them. Let's look at that for just a moment. Because, brethren, we certainly want to appreciate the great deliverance we have had from darkness. Our beginnings, brethren, like creation, were in darkness. They were. Psalm 107, 10 and 12. Such as sit in darkness in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction and iron, because they rebelled against the words of God and contemned the counsel of the Most High. You remember the counsel? Of every tree that is in this garden, you may eat of, but don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What did they do? They contemned. They despised. They counted it little, the counsel of the Lord. And thus they went into the very chains of iron and darkness. That's what happened. Therefore, he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down, and there was none to help. How about that, brethren? I'll tell you, being delivered from darkness is just that. And Sister Annie said a week ago, deliverance is something that only God can do. You don't walk out of darkness. I'll tell you right now, you don't walk out of it. We grope for the wall. We grope for the wall like the blind. We grope as if we had no eyes. It had been no difference if you could see, brethren. You would be no different than a blind man if you're in the dark. You see no differently than they do. If you're in the dark, we stumble at noonday as in the night. Have you not seen it to be so? Men stumble in the noonday. Why? Because they're in darkness. We're in desolate places as dead men. We roar all like bears and mourn sore like doves. We look for judgment, but there is none for salvation, but it is far off from us. Why? We're in the darkness. We're in the darkness. Acts 17, 26 to 27, Paul highlighted this. He hath made of one blood all nations of men to dwell on the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed in the bounds of their habitation that they should seek the Lord if happily they might. Feel after him. 
That's what it is. You've been in the dark. You know what it's like in the dark. It, even in rooms you've been familiar with, when the darkness, when it's dark, well, you, you go feeling. That's kind of what men were doing before the light shined, feeling after God. Why? Because they're in darkness. Now, it's not only that we were in an, an environment of darkness, but we ourselves were darkness. Brother, and that's even worse. Ephesians 5, 8, you were sometimes darkness, but now are you light in the Lord. Matthew 6, to 23, Jesus himself said, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. For if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness. Why? Because men's eyes are trying to be turned in two different directions. They want to focus on the earth and focus on heaven. You know what happens? Deep light gets poured into their spirit. How can the Pharisees put their hand to the Lord of glory and crucify him? Because their eye was evil. And whatever light they thought they had was nothing but pure darkness. And if you're in pure darkness, you'll even put your hand in boldness to the Lord of glory. You'll do it. We were there. That's what I'm telling you. We were darkness. Like the creation, our lives were formless and void of any good thing. I like that word void. You might use the word devoid. Well, the scripture uses the term without, without quite often. Second Thessalonians 3, 2 says, Paul encourages us to be warned because not all men that profess faith have it, that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. You realize we used to be in that category. You used to fit the bill there, brethren. You used to not have faith. Jeremiah 4, my people is foolish. They have not known me. They are sottish children. They have no understanding. Mm -hmm. We used to be there. You used to not have any understanding. That's what being in darkness is. In Jude, Paul, or, uh, Jude warned of men that come among the assembly claiming to know Christ but were devoid of the Spirit. Beloved, remember you the words which were spoken before the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the spirit. When we walked in our own ungodly lusts, it's because we were sensual and without the spirit. There was a time like that. Amen. There was a time like that. If any man loved the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And when we loved the world, the love of the Father was not in us either. We were all children of disobedience at that time, serving diverse lusts, living in pleasure, hateful and hating one another. We were darkness, just like the earth was darkness before God said, let there be light. A man wants to boast in his pedigree. You know, there's a lot of boasting today in men's pedigree. And I think, you know what? The one reason why they boast so much is because they don't take their pedigree back far enough. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You Gentiles, you want to boast in your pedigree? Remember that you being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time you are without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. In the very place that the devil is blinding the minds that then that believe not and prowling around as a lion, seeking whom he may devour. And you are without God. Now I'll tell you, we hardly have to mount any more evidence than to realize if there's going to be change, it's going to have to be for God, right? For God. And that is my point. So what did God do? Here's a five-step plan on how to get out of the darkness. Hope you can make it. Is that what he did? I used to think it was like that. I did, brethren. I used to think it was like that. Here's how you do it. He commanded. He commanded, let there be light. Our change is traceable to a word, the word of God. 
Consider, brethren, the power of God's word. Hebrews 4.12. The word of God is quick and powerful. We must learn, brethren, to associate God's word with doing something. Man, when he speaks, nothing happens, right? If you want to understand the impotence of man, see how much he's been able to do just by talking. Well, they talk too much. They're talkers. You know, what do we mean when we say that? We mean they're powerless to do what they say they can do. Well, when God speaks, things happen. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thundereth. The Lord is upon many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaketh the cedars. You want to know how powerful your word is? Go talk to a tree. Can you talk it down? Can you, God can talk it down. Yea, the Lord breaketh the cedars of Lebanon. He maketh them also to skip like a calf. Lebanon and Syrian like a young unicorn. The voice of the Lord divided the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shaketh the wilderness. The Lord shaketh the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord maketh the hinds to calf and discovereth the forest. And in his temple does everyone speak of his glory. But to what end, brethren? Does it bring glory to God to break trees down? Is that what this is about? The Lord sitteth on the flood. Yea, the Lord sitteth king forever. The Lord will give strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. It is that when God speaks, his people have peace. It is the voice of the Lord as it relates to his great work in redemption that is most marvelous. That's what's most marvelous. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the things whereunto I send it. Now let's demonstrate this. We have one right in our text. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Man has to start with things that do appear. But God made of nothing the world all about us. Every day the world is a marvelous testimony, if you can see it right, to the power of God's word. He spoke it into existence. Think of Jesus' ministry on the earth. I'm showing you that God, what God can do when he speaks, because he commanded light to shine out of darkness and by that same command shined light into your heart so follow me here and i'll get i'll get more focused here in just a second how about jesus ministry on earth you may recall one time a centurion man came to jesus a very humble man i don't know what the distance was to his house but he didn't feel it right for jesus to expend his energies to go ahead and go to his house although he had a servant there that was sick and about to die no doubt a servant that was precious to him or he wouldn't have made his way to Jesus in the first place. He would just get another servant. So this was a serious matter to this centurion man. And he said unto the Lord Jesus, Lord, trouble not yourself. For I'm not worthy that thou shouldest enter under my roof. Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee. But say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. Remember Jesus commanded him, said, I've not found faith so great in all of Israel. This man can see that I can do things just by saying the word. And that man went back to his house and found his servant whole. You see, God, sh Jesus showed us in his earthly ministry the power of speaking, of saying a word. Young man, I say unto thee, arise. Lazarus, come forth. Damsel, I say unto thee, arise, awake, take up your bed, and go to your house. Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him, and enter no more into him. Son, be of good cheer. Thy sins, which are many, be forgiven thee. He was powerful in his word. He just said it, and it happened. Now, I'll tell you, this transforms the exhortations of Scripture. Mm -hmm. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. How about that? Set your affection on things above and not on things on the earth. 
Make not provision for the flesh. Resist the devil. If you can see that right, that word comes with power. Hmm? And when it came to the darkness of our hearts, he changed it with a word. With a word. The point, brethren, salvation and illumination are the product of a very, very specific word from our God, right? We refer to it as the gospel. That's what it is, brethren. It is the gospel that is the power of God unto salvation. And it's, in its most general principle, that's what we see in this marvelous text because it was while the gospel was being proclaimed that God commanded that light be shining into your heart. Isn't that right? When Paul spoke to the Colossians, he wanted to encourage them and make sure they understood why they were making such progress in the faith. And so he said, we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. And of the love which ye have to all saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, where have you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel? You heard. That's marvelous, brother, when you can go out and you can see the evidences of the gospel powerfully working. Hmm? Can you do like Barnabas? Can you make your way around the churches and see the grace of God? If you see it right, you can. Faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, love one to another, and hope. I'll tell you, we didn't just get those. I heard one man say one time, and I saw it on a commercial, and I didn't understand at the time why it chafed against me, but it chafed against me. My faith is founded on evidence of the scriptures, and I've studied, and you got your faith from God. I understand there's studying involved in that, but he's the one who gave it to you as well as love, and as well as hope, through his powerful word, gave you substance from heaven and changed you, turned your course completely with the word. The word of the gospel of Christ Jesus. And Paul said, it is bringing forth fruit throughout all the world. Brethren, this text is in some sense a defense as to why Paul would never be diverted from preaching Christ. Why? Because this is the only word that bears fruit. And if you want a testimony of that, look back to creation. How did it get into existence? God commanded the light to shine out of darkness. And he's doing the same thing in the hearts of men. Although they are formless and void, and the service of their deep is total darkness. I'll tell you, this transforms your view of evangelism. Such trust, brethren, such trust have we of God. Our trust is not in ourselves. We commit ourselves to the message that we know brings light. It's not mysticism. And I thank you, Brother Gim, for what you said last night. We don't want people to get the idea that they can look at the gospel and somehow not have light. No, they are connected one to the other. This is the message by which God illuminates the hearts of men so that they will pay attention to the gospel message. They will be illuminated. It will happen. That's our God for you. He commanded light to shine out of darkness through this marvelous message. Paul says, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Why? Because this is the message that is the power of God unto salvation. It brought you out of darkness at first, and it will keep you out of darkness if you will pay attention to it. Thank God for this wonderful, wonderful message. And it is a focused message. What is God giving us in this light, this capacity, Sister June said last night, the illumination of the heart, the capacity to see, and what is he shining the light on? It's the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now I'll tell you, when you are set to focus on someone's face, it has a way 
of taking other things out of your vision. Because the gospel is a focused message. There are certain things that if you pay careful attention to the gospel, they become blurry. Praise God for the blurry things. Things that you don't pay so much attention to anymore. That's what looking to the face is. And brethren, the message of the gospel is targeted to turn men's attention away from everything but Christ Jesus and God working through Christ Jesus. That's what it's all about. In fact, you pay careful attention to that, the light will shine. It's marvelous. 2 Peter 1.19, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Why? Because we've seen this happening. Peter says, we've been seeing this happen. Men have focused on this gospel, and they have looked full face in the eyes of Jesus, and they've walked right out of darkness. Where until you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart. What is that word of prophecy? We have received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus is still the light of the world. And if men's vision can be clearly set toward that light, God will cause for light to shine out of darkness. And it doesn't just happen one time, brethren. If you want to continue to receive light, make much of the Lord Jesus Christ and his acceptability before God. I'll tell you, if I was the devil, you know what I would do? I would set a gospel that puts Jesus to the background and puts me to the foreground. You know just like I do. Anytime your attention has been turned to you, the light started going dim. Haven't you seen it? And I'll tell you, this is a horrible thing. This is a selfish age. Brother, you've got to learn to test the spirits in this regard. If you've got some kind of strain of thought that's turning your attention towards you, you had better abandon it. I don't care how justified it is. Because the light source isn't you. Amen. It's him. Amen. And the gospel turns our attention to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, here's the bottom line. Here's the bottom line. The greatest degree of knowledge that we will ever, ever see is God himself and his great glory. Our God is a beautiful God, if I can say it that way. There's a beauty to God. That's, that's what his glory is. There's a certain beauty to God that will draw you to him as you can see it. Amen. And the marvelous beauty of our God is most clearly seen in the face of Christ Jesus. There was a light that shined out from creation. There were some things you could see about God in creation. His eternal Godhead and his power. But it didn't give a full enough light, did it? Time came when the law was given by Moses. A fuller light shined. We understood there was a righteous demand from God, and it, it was a glorious light. Indeed, it was. But there was a greater light yet to shine. And that shining finally came to them that sat in the region and shadow of death. Light had finally sprung up. The greatest light that has ever been cast and ever will be cast is the light that Jesus cast toward his father. For he is the brightness of his glory and the express being of his person. He shines the brightest light toward God. So that if you want to know God the father in greater depth... You make much of Jesus. You abide close to him. This is such a wonderful truth. I heard a sermon this, or listened to, read a sermon this last week by Charles Spurgeon on this, and I was just drinking it in. <clears throat> there are things about God that can only be known in the face of Christ Jesus that aren't clearly seen anywhere else, even in the law and even in creation. And I'm just going to kind of wrap these things up with this word. Think of it from this perspective. Is God truly a God of uncompromising righteousness? Is that really true? Speaking of Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just 
and the justifier. Is God truly uncompromising when it comes to righteousness? Go to the foot of Calvary and see God not sparing his own son and wonder no more. Yes, indeed, he is. He is exactly what he has said he is. And you see that in the face of Christ Jesus. It becomes clear through him. You would never know, brethren, how much God truly hates sin and how much he truly loved righteousness until sin was put on his son, Jesus Christ, and he smote him. There you saw righteousness like you never saw it before in the law. This is his own son. And yet how clearly is the glory of God seen in the face of Christ Jesus? Is God truly a God abundant in goodness or truth? He said this. He that spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Rather than in the cross, God gave you the best he had. Huh? Is he going to be so abundant to give you the son of his own, of his love, and then hold back mercy or hold back goodness and the things you need for life and godliness? You might be surprised that you'll be tempted to think God is stingy in these areas. And if you ever get that way, go back to the cross again and see him not sparing his own son. He'll abundantly give you all things. Does God really prefer to save men over damning them? I used to think he did, and I used to think damning was, was the thing he was looking to do. And, and he can definitely do this, brother, and I'm not saying he can't. He will most definitely do this without hesitation. But when you go back to the gospel, you hear this proclamation, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. I'll tell you right now, if God really wanted to damn people, the mounting of evidence was never greater than when men were taunting the Son of God in his great affliction and torment of the cross, saying, if God will have him. I'll tell you, that's some serious sins before God. And yet, God didn't smite them. Why? Because his preference is to save men, not to damn them. And we see that in the face of Christ Jesus. Is God truly a God of comfort? Son, be of good cheer. Thy sins be forgiven thee. Is God truly a God of love? Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. Does God really intend that we have confidence in coming before his presence, having a high priest over the house of God? Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having a heart sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Is God a prodigious worker? And does he expect his people to be the same? Wherefore, my brethren... You also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. And does God really intend to take us out of this world and to bring us unto himself? In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Brethren, if, there was, if, there was, if this was the only evidence... That God's kingdom isn't earth-centered, it would be in this simple fact. Jesus didn't stay here. He left. He left. Why? Because he's going to prepare some plot for you on earth? If he was going to do that, he'd be here doing that. He's in heaven preparing a place for us. And he will come and receive us to himself that where he is, there we may be also. Brethren, the gospel is the place where this light shines. And so in conclusion, I suppose this could be the best thing I could say to wrap all these things up. Let us run with endurance the race that's set before us, looking unto Amen. Jesus. Amen. Thank you, brother.